Hey everybody, how are you doing? I'm doing sort of okay. Um, this has been quite a situation that we've been uh, thrust into. Um, and um, the content for this week actually I think is quite topically relevant um, because we are looking at theory that really addresses bad shit, right? Uh, bad feelings. Um, we're looking at a film for Thursday that's about these sort of more negative responses to the AIDS crisis, um, less activist maybe and more destructive responses. So we are kind of exactly in content that asks deep questions about um, responses to viral pandemic and government in action. And here we are living through a very similar thing, right? Um, so this lecture is going to be setting us up to watch The Living End uh, as a group for Thursday. I'm going to go over some things about the love reading. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for continuing to post on the discussion entries. Those really are going to be our main way of communicating from now on. Um, so please keep up with that. Um, I am here. I'm drinking my coffee. I've got my Miss Major mug. Miss Major was a Stonewall veteran, uh, trans one of color, and her famous line is, I am still fucking here. So I'm still fucking here. I hope you're still where you are. Um, so I'm going to click into this uh, video and um, give you some pointers about what's going on, and then we'll talk a bit about the content. Um, so first of all, a uh, list of reminders for what I'm calling the Corona Apocalypse. Um, first of all, I would really encourage you to take measures you need to take to stay safe um, and worry about class after that. Um, as you know, most of you who've emailed me, um, I've responded saying, you know, deadlines are going to become rather flexible, especially on, on major projects that we're working on. Um, the discussion boards, I would say people writing discussion entries, if you could do your best to maintain our 7 p.m. twice a week structure, that really will provide the backbone for everybody else. Um, but otherwise, things are going to be a little bit more flexible as we move through all these transitions we're going through. Um, also, please just take care of your health. Take vitamins, go on walks, do some push-ups, uh, wash your hands, do all that stuff. Um, Secondarily, I know a lot of you are worried about being able to talk to one another um, about your group um, reading and mapping projects, or just maybe to share resources or solidarity. We had quite a great intellectual community we were building in class. What I've done is I'm going to set up a Slack channel for our class. Um, so I'm going to send you all an email invite to that workspace, and that will, if you join it and download the app, um, you can also work on Slack on, your de on a desktop. Um, you will be able to join the workspace and then see everybody else and talk to everybody else in the class. So you can set up channels to just like share ideas, share resources, share memes, um, whatever we need to do to get through this period. So I will email that to you along with this announcement about this video lecture. Three, if you did not manage to grab queer graphic history on your way out the door, um, off campus. It is indeed available on the GVSU Libraries website as an ebook. Um, so if you need to review that text, it is there for you. Just search for it under book or books and it'll come up as an ebook. Um, also, for those of you who might not have primary access to a computer, say that your parents are home and needing to work on the computer in your house, you there is a Blackboard app you can download to your phone. It's not the best. I wouldn't necessarily use it to submit uh, files, but you could certainly type out discussion entries on it and check for updates and things like that. So consider that as an option. We are going to try to have all Blackboard processes continue as usual. Again, this is ideally, I know some people are picking up extra work, some people are having to do home care, um, people are doing all kinds of different things that have disrupted their schedules. Just please, let's try to stay somewhat on schedule. Um, especially with the discussion entries, and that's only one-fourth of the class per day, so hopefully that's manageable for people. Um, I'm also asking you to try to step up your comment participation on Blackboard, um, because really this is the one way that we're showing up as a group now, as these group discussions. Um, I'm asking for about 100 words, but also, you know, mix it up. Send us a video 
Um, you can you can actually embed video in the discussion threads. You could send us a voice uh, note from your phone. Um, it would be nice to be able to see and hear each other a bit. So consider that as an option. Um, I'll consider that on my end as well. Um, now, here's the tricky thing. We do have these reading and mapping theory projects. Um, your groups were set up a while ago, so ideally you've established contact with your teammates. Um, but again, I know that working together remotely is difficult. I would highly suggest if you haven't connected yet, use that Slack uh, workspace that I'm going to invite you to to find each other. Um, I'm going to ask you to send me the file that you've produced as well as then submit it on Blackboard for points. That way, if I have the file, uh, I can push it out to everybody else in the course, and that will help um, guide people's reading of the materials. I understand some people might be a little behind on this, so please do check in with me as you can. Um, and lastly, our final project, um, we just don't have, we didn't have, unfortunately, the kind of time and one-on-one -on -one contact to produce creative, the kind of creative work I wanted to encourage for the final project. So I've tr transitioned that over to an open book essay exam. It will give you some creative options. I'll try to make it really open-ended, uh, but I just think that's better for working remotely where we can't really present work to each other in a traditional format. So uh, those are the updates. One last thing, um, we have quite a few films in this last third of class. The Living End, which is our film for Thursday, as well as Bound, which is coming up are both films that I would suggest not watching in front of family members who are sensitive. Um, <laughs> both contain representations of queer sexuality and both contain some violence. Um, living, the Living End contains some scenes of also sexual violence. So I wanted to warn you about that, but also uh, warn you about people who might be around you in your new environment, wherever you are, okay? So, Sorry about all that, but we had to get through it. Um, so what are we talking about this class period? Um, we are talking about <clears throat> the antisocial thesis. Now we've been covering major turns in queer theory um, pretty much since the, the middle of the semester. And uh, the antisocial thesis is a body of theory that we haven't quite touched on yet. Um, we're following up on looking at Munoz's theory of disidentification, which was about blending identification and counter identification. We could say that the antisocial thesis is leaning fully into counter-identification. Um, it, is, it is a different mode of uh, queer engagement with the social. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic ideas here and then unpack love a little bit and then present some questions for you to think about while viewing the film. So what is it, the antisocial thesis? Um, it's a strain of queer theory, uh, really popularized uh, by Leo Bersani's book, uh, Homos, which was published in 1995. Uh, he has a chapter in that book called The Gay Outlaw. And in that first paragraph of that chapter, he asks this question, should the homosexual be a good citizen? And uh, <laughs> I mean, you guessed it, his answer was actually no, right? Like he, he proposed the idea that queer people didn't owe society anything, um, shouldn't be bound by society's rules, shouldn't um, obey societal norms, and that our main role was to be like totally resistant to those things, to even, maybe even to the concept of citizenship itself. Um, so this is a little different than disidentification, which was about blending kind of insider and outsider positions. This is just like total outsider. Um, so, you know, rather than considering ourselves to be part of society, the antisocial thesis would say queerness is fundamentally against society and also the state. Um, and that makes it a form of counter-identification, a rejection of the social and its rules, and a desire to escape the social. Um, so rather than um, trying to join society the way that we might think of a more identi identificatory style of like queer liberalism or assimilationist queerness. Antisocial queer theory would say, you know, these basic structures of our society, like the family, marriage, reproduction, capitalism, they're all pretty much oppressive and we should seek to escape them or resist them as much as possible. Even the concept of identity perhaps here is a trap, right? Um, so you can see how there's been a kind of strain of this questioning through everything we've read, um, but 
Antisociality is really the more the most pure expression of it. On the flip side, it also explores oppressive aspects of those positive social values we're taught to um, center and practice, like happiness, love, success, maturity, healthiness, all the things that the state wants us to invest in as the good life. Um, the antisocial thesis would question whether those are actually valuable to pursue, um, or are they not just expressions of oppression? The antisocial thesis also focuses on the radical potential of negative queer experiences, and this is where love really comes in, right? Her piece is called The Politics of Refusal. What does it mean to say no, um, to refuse to identify with certain things, to um, admit our that we carry around a lot of shame, to admit our anger, to d admit how disgusted we are, how sad we are, the fact to come to grips with the fact that we'll never probably be fully included um, and that we're all <laughs> unfortunately going to die. Like what, what does it mean to confront those things as a queer, queer or trans person? Um, so this is the product of a kind of pro-gay marriage politics that really reached its peak in the late 1990s um, and took over that was saying, no, no, we need positive images of queer people. We need to join this, the nation. We need to join society. We need to assimilate into institutions. And there are a bunch of theorists saying, okay, but that doesn't really make me, I don't really feel any better uh, like about myself. Um, aren't we just covering over a deeper problem by you know, seeking to join these other institutions? So that's kind of the antisocial thesis broadly. Um, now, when we get to The Living End, we're gonna look at a couple movies, The Living End and Bound, that both position queer people as kinds of outlaws or people who escape the law people who are working outside the system, right? And people who are figured as outsiders to the social in different ways. So um, we could think about political outlaws, anarchists, permanent, outsiding, per permanent outsider roles as roles that queer people would find themselves in and would actually embrace um, through the antisocial thesis. So I asked you to look back at queer graphic history just to kind of cover um, how they describe this turn um, the authors there say that in the early 2000s, this antisocial turn took place shifting away from projects that focused on reclaiming, reconstructing, and redeeming queer sex, right? Uh, saying gay is good, right? We turned away from that and toward highlighting negative features of these identities and types of sexuality and gender. Um, and we'll be looking at a couple people who contributed to this, um, mostly Jack Halberstam and Sarah Ahmed, which are on our reading list for the rest of the semester. Um, but you know, this idea that heteronormativity is intrinsically linked with things like capitalism, success, productivity, reproductivity, being upwardly mobile, gaining wealth, striving towards happiness, right? All these things that inform the idea of living a good life or being a good person. Um, we are really tempted to buy into this narrative as queer people in order to feel better about ourselves. And these theorists are really skeptical about that. So we can see over, um, over on the right hand side of the screen, this person who's kind of like throwing all that junk away and saying, uh, I need to redefine what success looks like for me as a queer person, because I don't want these normative things. Um, and then, of course, Lee Edelman uh, wrote a really famous book called No Future, um, where uh, he kind of intervened by saying that instead of trying to make queers recognized by showing how productive, stable, and happy we can be, that we can be just like straight people, um, we should instead be antisocial and question all the social norms and really start developing theories about the shared experience of shame rather than pride. Um, so. You know, I saw some people responding to that on the discussion entries, but that's kind of where a lot of this is centered, is around this discussion of pride versus negativity or positivity versus negativity. Some more about this. Um, so early on in the semester, we talked about how the fundamental question of queer theory is what do queers want? Um, and we've talked about the function of utopia, right? The, the perfectly impossible place or the impossibly perfect place, right? The place that is perfect and therefore cannot be, but we want anyway. Um, 
Well, there are a couple of different ways to interpret that term. So um, the antisocial thesis would actually talk uh, would actually be referring to the negative definition of utopia, um, as well as freedom. So instead of freedom in society, we want freedom from society, right? We want to leave society behind. And rather than a good place, uh, utopia can also mean no place, right? Again, this idea of escaping or leaving behind or going to no place. Um, so freedom from being in the place versus access to a good place, right? There's a kind of inherent tension in this idea of utopia and antisocial thesis kind of puts its money down on the no place interpretation. Um, so we could think of antisocial queer theory um, indicating the critical force of refusal, right? This idea of saying, no, not yet, not enough, not me. You know, I don't want this. Don't make me do this. Um, I am not participating. Fuck you, <laughs> right? All those emotions that we've been asked to kind of ignore in order to participate in society. Um, and it uses this idea of rejecting what exists as a critical practice that should make obvious what should exist. So if we say no to something, it's because we want something else, whether or not that thing exists. And uh, this strain of queer theory really does have its roots, roots in psychoanalysis. So um, the id uh, and the theory of the death drive, as well as the experience of the AIDS crisis. And that's really where we're gonna focus for Thursday. We're gonna be reading an excerpt of Queers Read This, which is an AIDS era manifesto. Uh, and then we'll also look at kind of how queer life shifted and the kinds of emotions that came up around um, the government inaction about the AIDS crisis and the kinds of art people made to respond to that um, generational experience. So love, what's up with love? Uh, first of all, she is the Arlie Brownlee Term Associate Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and her this piece we read is the conclusion to her book, Feeling Backward, um, Loss and the Politics of Gay History. So it's the very end of the book, which I thought was appropriate for this idea of backwardness. Um, and in that book, Love asks what use we might make of backward queer feelings and actions that refuse to invest in the future um, or to participate in progress narratives. So what do we do with kind of like problematic queer people who just um, aren't future oriented? You know, um, she looks at a number of writers who have queer figures in their work who just kind of refuse to get on board with things and just are these kinds of like dead ends. And also people who refused when this idea of gay and lesbian identity started to be created in the in the early 20th century, uh, a lot of people actually didn't like it and wanted to continue being labeled other things like invert um, uh, and didn't want to be called gay, even though gay was supposed to be a more positive term. So what's a, what is it about people refusing to be, become future oriented and want to keep looking backward at the past or at older forms of, of being that don't feel as, I don't know, neoliberal or, or, or uh, success oriented? So in the piece, Love attempts to imagine a politics that refuses to engage in things like nationalism, the, re the reproductive imperative, meaning like have kids, right? Naive forms of optimism or in the empty promises of redemption from trauma, right? Like we could come out and get over our trauma and become healthy queer people. Uh, I think Love is pretty suspicious that that could ever actually happen, <laughs> given the fact that no matter how much work we do on ourselves, we li still live in a culture that fundamentally says we don't exist. Um, and we haven't been able to really develop a theory about the damage that causes and, and what kind of culture it might actually produce. Um, uh, and so Love is talking about the post-Stonewall politics of pride, and she's saying, well, sure, pride was great um, in terms of like getting straight recognition for queer people, but we have not actually become liberated from the shame or bad feelings that we go through as queer people, like that continues. We continue to have those bad feelings. We continue to carry the shame. We continue to not feel completely accepted um, because the damage has already been done. And what do we do with that? Um, I wanted to show you this clip from 
uh, Vito Russo made a, a really, he wrote a really great book called The Celluloid Closet about representation of queer identities and sexualities in classic Hollywood. And I wanted to show you this little clip of Susie Bright, who's a famous uh, sex therapist and bisexual ad, 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 ad activist, talking about her response to a film called um, The Children's Hour, which is a really uh, tragic melodrama in which a gay character actually uh, dies. Um, you know, we're supposed to dislike this film intensely. It's a really toxic kind of stereotypical um, representation. But Bright says there's actually something useful in it. Back in Hollywood, the production code had gradually been whittled away. Movie makers, fed up with restrictions, set out to smash the last taboo. Homosexuality was finally being talked about on the screen, but only as something that nice people didn't talk about. And we've seen things, too. What things? Bad things. I can't tell you. Mira, you're annoying me very much. If you have anything to say, say it. I mean, I can't say it out loud. I've got to whisper it. Why must you whisper it? I don't know. I've just got to. At the time that we made the picture, there were not real discussions about homosexuality. It was about a child's accusations. It could have been about anything. Stop the car, John. Stop the car, John. So none of us were really aware. We might have been the forerunners, but we weren't really because we didn't do the picture right. We were in the mindset of, um, of not understanding what we were basically doing. You've got to know. I've got to tell you, I can't keep it to myself any longer. I'm guilty. You're guilty of nothing. These days, <laughs> there would be a tremendous outcry, as well there should be. Why would Martha break down and say, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? I'm so polluted. I'm, I've ruined you. I'm... She would fight. She would fight for her budding preference. And when you look at it, to have Martha play that scene and no one questioned what that meant or what the alternatives could have been underneath the dialogue. It's, uh, it, it's mind boggling. We were unaware. Don't you see? I can't stand to have you touch me. I can't stand to have you look at me. Oh, it's all my fault. I ruined your life and I ruined my own. of this subject was not in the lexicon of our rehearsal period even. Audrey and I never talked about this. Isn't that amazing? Truly amazing. The loathing she feels, how sick she is with herself, it still makes me cry when I see that. And I think, you know, why am I crying? Why does this still get to me this is just an old silly movie you know and people don't feel this way anymore but i don't think that's true i think people do feel that way today still and there's part of me despite all my little signs you know like happy proud well-adjusted bisexual queer kinky you know no matter how many posters i hold up saying i'm a big pervert and i'm so happy about it there's this part of me that's like how could i be this way okay so I think you could kind of hear there uh, how, you know, Bright is responding. Like Shirley MacLaine is saying, we made the movie wrong. We should have made a movie that was about positive images. We should have made a movie that about like um, queer people fighting for their rights and like achieving liberation. And then <laughs> Bright comes along and says, you know, actually this movie gets at some things still that despite all my flags, um, you know, queer people, we love our flags. 
going to have a flag for every single person on the planet. Um, <laughs> but, you know, despite all the pride discourse, there's still a part of us that wonders how on earth we became this way. And, you know, there are no answers. And we have to carry that around. And so, you know, pride discourse doesn't really, all this, this whole record of like positivity and, and respectability and, and, and positive images and representation doesn't really solve the problem of like the trauma of being queer in a straight world, which, which usually gets uh, inculcated into us at a very young age, like far before we even understand what's happening to us. So I think love is trying to get at some of those problems here. Um, and she says, you know, the problem also is that this pride discourse, it's not that it's, it's just about making people feel better, but it's also about developing these new norms that expect us to be happy and responsible and good examples, um, that we are, we're invested in society. We want to, we want to, um, prove that we belong. Um, and most, most queer, most people who achieve any kind of queer celebrity are these kinds of people, right? Like they're people who make, uh, who like perform their uh commitment to the the existing social structures you know think about it um and that could be a problem that could be that could be a problem like who aren't we hearing from who don't we learn about why are there not many many different ways of being queer that are represented um so it's kind of what love is talking about when she talks about backwardness is this feeling that there's something else that isn't being captured here um so um, this is a really important quote from page 147 where she writes, there are forms of queer negativity that are in no sense good for politics, meaning uh, no se they're in no sense good for like making rights claims. There are other self-hatred, despair, refusal that we have yet to consider because their connection to any recognizable form of politics is too tenuous. Still many of these unlikely feelings are closely tied to the realities of queer experience past and present. A more capacious understanding of political aims and methods might in fact draw on such experiences. As many critics have argued, the politics of gay pride will only get us so far, right? And she says, such an approach does not address the marginal situation of queers who experience the stigma of poverty, racism, AIDS, gender dysphoria, disability, immigration, and sexism, nor does such an approach come to terms adequately with sexual shame with the way that the closet continues to operate powerfully in cont contemporary society and media. Finally, the assertion of pride does not deal with the psychic complexity of shame, which lingers on well into the post-Stonewall era. Really key quote. So some questions here, um, and we should be thinking about these for uh, Thursday, right? Um, I think some things love is pointing to are questions like how might queer activism be carried out through things like evasion, refusal, despair, and reluctance? Like what is it we're saying no to? And how might we think about that as a way of asserting a kind of political orientation um, when we like refuse to believe in or do certain things versus asking for or demanding things? Um, what might a backward politics that admitted the continuing negative experience of being queer and trans look like? Um, it certainly wouldn't look like gay pride. Um, I think uh, Love is asking us to develop a different kind of idea of, of political action here, a backwardness. How might queer politics address the ongoing reality of feeling bad? Um, right? Like, what do we do with our bad feelings? Do we just sit on them? Do we don't? Do we not get to express them? Do we pay lots of money and go to therapy to like say them to somebody safe? You know, what do we do with that stuff? Um, and where does it go? And as we move into the so-called better future, what and who are we asked to leave behind? And this goes, I think Love is curious about the archive of queer history and like what kinds of queer histories get lost because they don't tell a recognizable story of progress or uh, rights claims or recognizable activism or role models, right? What about people who don't show up in history that way? Do, are they just gone forever? We don't know what to do with them. So there are some broad uh, questions. Now, um, for next class, we are indeed watching this movie, The Living End, um, an irresponsible movie by Greg Araki. He's a Chinese-American film director um, who's made a lot of movies. Um, but this is a movie, his one movie about the AIDS crisis. Um, 
And so I have a few things for you to think about before you watch. Um, and you're going to be taking a look at Queers Read This also, which is uh, just a little seven-pager along with this film. So the first thing is, for this film, I would definitely begin with the podcast I posted. Um, it's only about, I think, 13 minutes. Um, just to get oriented, uh, this is an independent queer, new queer cinema film, so it, it's important to understand the context of its production and authorship. Um, so, And there aren't any spoilers necessarily in there. So listen to that. And then I'd like you to take some notes while watching on a few things. Like, how is this film different from other queer romance films that you've seen? Um, and if you've seen any films from the 1990s particularly, you might be able to draw comparisons here. Um, you can imagine kind of why this film doesn't get watched in the same way that, say, But I'm a Cheerleader gets watched, or... Um, the incredibly true story of two girls in love gets watched, right? There are queer kind of like nostalgia cultures of reception for those films, but not for this one. So why? How is this a film that gets lost just in the same way that love is worried about people getting lost from history? Um, to thinking about the characters as allegory here. So um, what do they stand in for, the two main characters? Um, John and Luke, uh, who, what larger ideas or figures might they actually represent symbolically? Um, so watch the film as a narrative, but also think about the symbols it's using. Uh, three, how is this film in conversation with the idea of backwardness from love? Um, and lastly, this film is subtitled An Irresponsible Movie. Um, why? Uh, what do we think Araki is doing by labeling the film irresponsible? So I've loaded the film into Blackboard and also the podcast. Uh, so take a look at those. Um, now, um, for my last slide here, um, just a few reminders. Don't forget. Um, I'm going to have you travel back to the discussions tab right now at the end of this video lecture to respond to a prompt uh, in, in relation to some of this content. Um, so make sure to do that um, sometime this evening. Uh, then again, discussion entry, the next one is for group four, and it will be in response to the film and Queers Read This. So we're on our regular schedule. Uh, please try to post by 7 p.m. tomorrow. Um, also, please make sure to comment on all discussions. Um, this is your main way of showing up for the course for now. And um, be watching for another video lecture. I will try to put out a video video content for every scheduled class meeting that we've had. Um, I'm optimistic that I'll be able to do that. We'll see what happens with my technology. Um, but yeah, uh, travel over to discussions to give me a few thoughts about this content, and um, I will see you through a screen soon. Okay, bye.